You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 23rd, 2019, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, telemedicine and allergy. Our presenter is yours truly, Dr. Jay Portnoy. I'm the Medical Director of Telemedicine at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Welcome back to Conferences Online Allergy from beautiful downtown Kansas City. Uh, And uh, we're going to shift gears now. We were talking about allergen immunotherapy. Um, which is old. It's uh, central to what allergists do, but it's been around for a really long time. And now we're going to talk about something that maybe someday will be central to what allergists do, but is relatively new. How's that for a transition? (laughs) Segway. Um, So we're going to talk about telemedicine and allergy. And one of the hats that I wear, besides being an allergist, is I'm the medical director of telemedicine for Children's Mercy Hospital. Uh, I don't know what that means, but uh, it's fine. I, I'll take it. Sounds impressive. Uh, I met some good friends of mine. Here's some of my robot friends here. Uh, go to national meetings. I actually attended a meeting as a robot. <clears throat> this is a meeting that I went to. Uh, I don't recall which conference it was. But there was a robot there that they allowed me to log into, and then I could wander up and down the hallway talking to people, and I could go into sessions and watch the sessions and so on as a robot, so I didn't have to travel to wherever the meeting was. I, I don't recall where the meeting was. I thought it was just fun uh, when it was lunchtime. Uh, rather than going to lunch, I went back to the to the display area and got plugged in. So I, my lunch was electrons. They were delicious. Let's get started. <laughs> These are my disclosure. They're the same disclosures as the, they haven't changed in an hour. Learning objectives have changed. That that's good. Um, Here's a few fun facts. Uh, More than half of all U.S. hospitals currently have a telemedicine program. Um, I don't know if it's hospitals of a certain size or not, but but it's becoming more common. Telehealth is expected to grow in the U.S. at a compound annual growth rate. It sounds like an investment, doesn't it? Of 27%, reaching $9.35 billion by 2021. So it's it's really a, a very rapidly expanding that area. 800,000 online consults in the United States in 2015. Uh, 22% of employers with 1,000 or more employees currently offer telemedicine services, and another 27% of employers plan to offer it by the end of this year. Uh, our employer does. We, we have one of the, our, I work at a hospital. We all are employees of this hospital. We get health care through the hospital, at least most of us do. And one of the options we have is that we can uh, use urgent care services online by telemedicine. And our hospital health plan will subsidize that and help pay for it because they would rather that we do that than that we actually go to a brick-and-mortar urgent care center. It's a lot cheaper and efficient. It's cheaper. That's why they do it. But it makes it a better benefit. 86% of physicians surveyed said they were satisfied with the quality of care provided while utilizing a telemedicine system. These are physicians who used one. Uh, 83% of patients who participated in a visit felt they'd received quality care. Patients who were very satisfied with the care they received. 78% of patients said they felt comfortable enough with the system they would use it again. That's a good statement. 76% care more about access to care than the need for human interactions with their health care provider. They don't see the doctor because they want the laying on of, of flesh with energy transfers and that chit-chat personal. I don't go to the doctor because I want to be a friend with my doctor. I go to the doctor because I want to get health care. And that's what most people do. Some people want to chat and have a relationship and and the doctor to be their best friend. But most people don't. They want to get their health care issues addressed and get on with their lives. The doctor is not the <laughs> best friend, necessarily. 29 states and the District of Columbia uphold laws mandating health plans cover telehealth services. If you can be seen in person, then you must also be paid for to be seen by telehealth. In 29 states, and that's increasing each year. So um, it's, it's increasing. 
Okay. Well, I like this scenario. I've done this for a couple of years now. Just imagine you're a mom and you've got a young, you've got two kids. You've got a young child and you've got an older, like a two-year-old and a six-month-old. And the six-month-old wakes up and looks like that. Okay, your worst nightmare. 6 a.m., the kid's screaming. He, maybe he has an ear infection. I, I don't know what's wrong with him, but he's really unhappy. The two-year-old is still asleep in bed, and, of course, the dad's on a trip somewhere. Who knows? Your bite so. What do you do? That's really a terrible dilemma. You, you notice down the street there's this uh, wonderful urgent care clinic that's open 24 hours a day. You can take you have to wake your two-year-old up. You have to get everybody bundled up. You have to go to that clinic. You have to wait in line. You have to pay the fees. You'd, God only knows. It's, it doesn't really sound very appealing, and it just makes your life a little bit less uncom less pleasant. Um, the other option is you reach for your cell phone, and you press a button somewhere in here, and you click, and you select the kind of doctor you see. I want an urgent care doctor who specializes in screaming six-month-olds at 6 a.m., <laughs> and within a few minutes, the smiling provider logs on, and you tell them your problem and get some advice. Look, what a wonderful possibility that is. Who, would, who wouldn't choose the second choice? <clears throat> okay, it's Uber. It's Uber for medicine. Um, why, why, why is Uber successful? Uh, well, we could take taxis uh, or we could do Uber. This is not a non sequitur. There's a reason for me showing this comparison. Uh, the taxi is not always available. The quality is iffy. It's dirty, cramped cars a lot of times. The payment is a hassle. I don't even know what I'm being paying uh, in advance. A lot of, most of the time they won't take my credit card because they want cash so they don't have to re it and you might be taken for a ride, literally. Uh, unpredictable prices and uh, the experience is often variable and in, in many cases not very favorable. Uber, you call them when you want them. You're on demand from your phone. Quality is measured. You grade the driver, the driver grades you, and that, as a result, the quality is usually pretty good because everybody's being graded. Uh, the cars are usually pretty nice. It's the guy's personal car. It's no hassle with payment. You pay before you get in the, in the car. You already know. You've given the tip. You, everything is done. Uh, for prices, you know what the price is before you hit the select button. The experience is almost always good. I've, I've not had any bad ex I'm sure there's somebody who had a bad experience, but I've never had a bad experience. Okay. Why would anybody choose a taxi over Uber? Why would anybody choose an in-person health visit over a virtual visit? Let's compare the medical office with the direct-to-consumer telemedicine. You have to make an appointment. You have to, the quality is unknown. You maybe get word of mouth from somebody else who went to that provider. You have to travel. It takes time. It's only open certain hours. The payment, who knows what you're going to pay. depends on the health plan, the co-pays, what procedures are done. And whoops, the, the, uh, the, lab tech, the, the, the radiology technician isn't in your network, so suddenly you're, 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 not, you're paying a lot more. Who, who knows? There's a lot of traps, a lot of gotchas in healthcare. Experience may be good, it's hands-on, but I would venture that most of us can relate an unpleasant experience. Direct-to-consumer is on demand when you want it. Quality is measured. Uh, in healthcare, it's still problematic, but uh, what, what do you measure and how do you measure it? But they, they try to measure it. Uh, you don't have to travel anywhere. It's always available. Uh, predictable price for the visit. You know exactly what you're going to pay before you do it. And the experience is also good, even without the hands-on. The physical laying on of hands is not there. But generally, the experience is good. A lot of providers, a lot of companies provide this type of service. This, this is just a few of them. There are many more. I'm not necessarily endorsing any of them. Uh, Teladoc, America Well, Doctor on Demand, MD Live. There's, there's a whole bunch of them. And, and uh, I think I don't know which one our health plan uses. It's, they've got their own app that's through the health plan, but it connects you to one of these platforms, I'm pretty sure, and, it, and you get to talk to a provider and they will give you advice. The advice could very well be come into the urgent care clinic and be seen, but it turns out that 70 to 80% of the time the problem can be resolved with the online visit. That's pretty good. Telemedicine is playing a major role in healthcare delivery. The revenue is expected to reach $1.9 billion by last year. I guess I need to 
update this slide. Uh, projected growth rate is 56%. Consumers are engaged, cost-conscious, tech-savvy, and convenience-driven. That's why they're doing telemedicine and not going to the doctor's office. And they want convenience over quality. Millennials, in particular, favor mobile health care. 82% prefer telemedicine. Um, if you ask them, they really hate going to a doctor's office. 54% of them will postpone an appointment because they can't take time off from work. They don't want to have the high co-pays. It takes too long to get an appointment to be seen. Long waits. And a lot of millennials don't have a primary care doctor. They use urgent care, ad hoc care. And that's what they want. And we can tell them that's bad and they don't care what we tell them. They will do what they want. 71% of uh, younger ones are likely to cancel appointments in a brick and mortar because of the problem they have went away by the time the appointment comes up. It's what they want. They want care when they want it. They don't like the usual waiting room doctor experience. 66% of urgent care centers have waiting times less than 20 minutes. 9,000 urgent care centers expected to grow. Uh, so they, they want urgent care. They want care when they want it, whether it's online or urgent care. And 37%, as I said, offer on-demand telemedicine. So the patients don't have to leave work. You can do your telemedicine visit from your workplace if you want to or from your home. Um, it, and employers like that too. Instead of the employee taking off for two hours to go to the doctor's appointment, they can do a 20-minute visit in your office and with the door closed. There's no travel expenses. There's less interference with other responsibilities. Um, you can't get a viral infection by telemedicine. If I go to a doctor's office, I can get an infection. When I do it by online, the worst I can get is a vi computer virus, I, I suppose. And it does prevent unnecessary ER visits because, um, well, people go to the ER when they have no alternative. Providers can treat more patients with fewer resources. You don't have to, it just takes less time. Uh, you can see more patients, it improves remote monitoring, fewer missed appointments, you can charge for services. You already provide for free. A lot of patients are calling you in the middle of the night. If they, if they spoke to you by telemedicine, you could charge for that service. Uh, and you can offer your appointments from your home. You can see your patients from home. Uh, and not have to go into an office. You don't have to have a receptionist, an overhead, the utilities. It's just all online. Uh, you can leverage your expertise to help primary cares better provide care to their patients. You can log in. The primary care can actually invite you into their office to provide a consultation. You can do it in real time. It's important for rural areas where there aren't any specialists. And real-time consultation while in the PCP offices, I just said. It's something that's being done. 20% of the factors for satisfaction relate to improved effectiveness were due to improved outcomes. The te technology is easy to use. Communication is improved. It improves access to care, empowers patients to care for their chronic conditions, and it reduces wait times. Okay, enough. What is telemedicine? <clears throat> Not enough commercial. <laughs> okay, now that you're I've got your attention. Um, it's the remote delivery of healthcare services and clinical information. <coughs> using telecommunications technology. It's the American Telemedicine Association's definition. They, they have to use big words. Makes it sound more impressive. Basically, seeing patients with a computer. Two types of telemedicine. There's asynchronous and synchronous. Asynchronous means the patient and provider are not online at the same time. You don't have to be online when the patient is. Store and forward, email, patient porter, portals, that, that kind of stuff, or remote monitoring of patients. Synchronous means that the patient and provider are online at the same time, uh, usually by two-way video conferencing, although telephone is a form of telemedicine, if you think about it. It could be audio only. There are non-facilitated and facilitated visits. Uh, non-facilitated visit is uh, a visit where there's, uh, you can do it from anywhere, from your home. Basically, the patient uses their own equipment, and the doctor or provider connects to the patient with their equipment, uh, and the patient can be seen from wherever they want to be seen. And it can either be scheduled in advance or the patient can call you ad hoc. Uh, you can't really do a physical exam, although if there's a rash that 
the patient's camera on their device might be sufficient to, to see the rash, perhaps, but you can't listen to lungs or do anything more extensive than that. Um, there's a limited ability to do the physical exam. Uh, you can't charge for a CPT code for a new visit if you can't do a physical exam. To do a new visit by CPT code, you have to have history, decision-making, and physical exam. You have to have all three of those. If you can't do the physical exam, you can't do a new patient visit using CPT codes. That's just the way it is. Uh, Follow-up visits, on the other hand, you can do without a physical exam. You only need history and decision-making. Physical exam is not required when you do a follow-up visit with your patients. Did you know that? I mean, a lot of times you do it anyway. It's a it's good practice, and many times the exam does help. You need to do a physical exam. But there are times when you don't need it, and if you don't do it, you don't have to do it. You can still bill for a follow-up exam. Facilitated visits means the patient goes somewhere where they use the doctor's equipment. The provider, they, 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 they don't use their own. They use the, the institution's equipment. And, and then there's a, usually a nurse or somebody facilitating to turn on the equipment and, and control doing the physical exam. So you can do a physical exam using digital exam equipment. And it basically serves as a replacement for an in-person visit, a virtual visit. This is a taxonomy. I, I love taxonomy. <laughs> we just finished doing botany, and now we're doing telemedicine. Basically, telemedicine is the same thing as e-health, electronic health. Same thing, and there can be either edu used for education or for patient care. Education is things like COLA. We're doing telemedicine right now, but it's medically related education. Uh, you can also do peer-to-peer -peer where specialists and primary care get together and talk about cases and do that kind of education. There's lots of different kinds of education. But mostly we think of patient care. Patient care can be used for triage, like an e-consult, if we're not getting into that. Um, you can do proxy care. I can have a virtual ICU or during transport or remote surgery where one doctor tells another doctor what to do. So you're taking care of the patient by proxy with a different provider. Uh, but mostly we're talking about a virtual visit, which is really provider to patient. And, and there can be asynchronous and synchronous. Uh, the asynchronous is basically labs to provider, uh, store and forward, uh, get an x-ray, and then it's read by a radiologist who's somewhere else, and then they send the report and that kind of stuff. Uh, there can also be remote patient monitoring. A patient wears a device and you monitor how they're doing. Uh, synchronous involves uh, uh, the, the patient and provider have to be online at the same time. Those can be unfacilitated. Uh, that can be an unscheduled acute care like we talked about with the mom and the urgent care visit. Or you can schedule a maintenance visit or follow-up appointment in the allergy clinic. can be uh, unfacilitated as long as it's a follow-up appointment. Uh, facilitated, you can do a physical exam. And that can either be scheduled initial visit or a scheduled maintenance visit. For remote monitoring, there are digital monitoring equipment to pay. We can monitor how often they use their inhaler, for example, if we want to do it that way. There's a lot of devices that can be used for remote monitoring. But mainly we use facilitated visits here at Children's Mercy. Um, the patient goes to a clinic where there's a, our equipment and there's a facilitator who turns on the equipment and and the patient checks in, and they, but the thing is that the clinic is near where they live. They don't drive four hours across Kansas to be seen in Kansas City. They can go to Wichita or Junction City or Joplin or someplace closer to where they live. And that, that's the benefit. Um, so when the patient goes to a nearby clinic, it's called the patient site or the near site. It's the origination. Uh, we like to be patient-centered so that it's, it originates with the patient. Should be set up like a regular medical exam room because they're familiar with that. It makes them comfortable. There's a facilitator. Uh, there's a telemedicine cart where the computer and the camera and all that stuff is and a connection to the Internet. Uh, it's good to have digital exam equipment like a stethoscope, an otoscope, a dermoscope, an ophthalmoscope. You can see the retina with the, by telemedicine. The ophthalmologists do that. And then there should be options for getting blood tests and radiology and spirometry and all that. We have spirometers in each of our outlying clinics where they can do pulmonary function tests. This is actually a portable telemedicine cart. You can grab, the facilitator can grab that, go to a clinic, set it up, connect to the Internet, and do telemedicine. Yeah, it's portable. So it's, it's really not a big deal to set up a patient site. 
The provider side is where I go, or the provider goes. Um, the provider needs to, this is where I, I used to be my office with the best view in town. You can still go there and see it, but it's, I don't have that office anymore. Um, but I would do telemedicine. I would see the patient on this computer here, and my EMR was right there, and I talked to them, and um, it was fantastic. Um, so the surgeons can do the same thing. It's, it's the place where the provider is located when they're providing care to the patient. Okay, so again, the originating site <clears throat> is where the patient lives. It's a medical building or a hospital. It could be a school. That could be a place where the, it's got to be where the patient is. It's a sending room where they're seen can be set up like a traditional exam room, and you need a facilitator, telemedicine cart, exam equipment, and testing capabilities. Uh, my site, I need, it can be anywhere, even outside of the country. I can sit in Belize. Wouldn't that be nice? And <laughs> from the beach. You, you gotta be, it's got to be private, HIPAA compliant, all that. But Belize has some very nice private beaches. Right here. <laughs> Usually central practice location. That could be the provider's home. You could do that. Private room to preserve confidentiality. And, and you don't want to have pictures of cookie stuff in the back, so you could put up a little poster or be in front of a bookcase or someplace that looks professional. It's nice to do that. Um, you want to have access to an EMR. You want to have a com computer running the provider access software and a reliable internet connection. And I recommend that you have a backup also in case your connection goes down. I, I keep a MiFi hotspot I can turn on immediately. If my connection fails, I can reconnect very quickly. Good idea to have backup. Um, when you're seeing the patient by telemedicine, and the patient goes into their room, you're in your room, uh, look into or near the camera when you're seeing them. Uh, it turns out that if you're looking near the camera, they think you're looking into the camera. You can't really tell where you're looking at precisely. So I always state who I am, where I'm located, and that you, I can be heard. I'm in Kansas City. You're in Wichita. Can you hear me? It's good to establish that right at the beginning just so everybody knows where everybody is. Explain that every so often I may, you may look away. If, if I'm looking at the EMR, I'm looking over there, they're kind of wondering, what are you looking at? And in a face-to-face -face visit, they can see you looking at the EMR, but in, in telemedicine, they, they don't really know what you're looking at. Uh, you can print instructions to their location. You can send prescriptions to their pharmacy. You can order blood tests. Uh, we, we don't do allergy skin tests by telemedicine. Um, after all, I'm just a computer screen. I have no arms. I can't do skin tests. But it's really not safe. You have to have a provider on site in order to do skin tests. So we just do spir uh, blood tests. Uh, and then spirometry is available, too. The nurses need to be trained to do it. You can do a physical exam. The question I'm always asked, well, how do you do an exam? Well, you can. Here it is. Here's a, you can use a digital equipment to do this exam. Here's a digital stethoscope. You can look in the ear. You can look in the mouth. It's perfectly fine. You find it totally adequate. Lots of different kinds of equipment, and there's more coming out all the time. So it, it's really not a problem. Scheduling. It takes about as long to see a patient in person as it does by telemedicine. In fact, telemedicine visits are often a little bit shorter. There's less chit-chat, less kind of walking into the room and doing all that, getting acquainted stuff. The patient's already there waiting for you. You, you connect in and you just start talking. It takes a little bit faster. Uh, you want to maintain eye contact with the camera. Uh, you Ideally, if you haven't done this before, do a trial run before you see patients just to make sure you're familiar with it. At our hospital, we require a training site where you spend a little bit of time practicing with it. And, and it's, you want to have spare parts if the, if the microphone fails or the equipment, the cord fails or whatever. You want to be able to replace it pretty quickly. Some things are more likely to fail than others. And most important, have a technical support number that you can call the tech dude and, or their babe or whatever and, and, and get advice. So what does our program look like? Uh, it looks like a specialty clinic on the inside and out. Um, we have all of the same kinds of people. It looks the same. It really is the same. Because Children's Mercy owns all of our outlying sites. In a private practice, you don't have to own it. You can rent space. You can just you can rent space from another doctor and have just use one of their exam rooms and, and so on. You don't have to own it. But, but uh, whatever, you want to be able to control it and have both the patient and provider sites. Uh, live, interactive, two-way, audiovisual. Uh, and we usually have a, an RN, although we have some respiratory therapists too who can serve as a telefacilitator. Who can 
who should do it? Well, it's not for everybody. Some, some providers really want that hands-on chit-chat relationship with their patient's experience. They should not do telemedicine. Don't do it if you don't want to. You shouldn't do it. If you really want to, then you should. You must be licensed to practice in the state where the patient is, not where you are. If I'm in, if I'm in uh, Kansas uh, and I'm seeing a patient in New Jersey, I have to be licensed in New Jersey to do that. If I'm in New Jersey and the patient's in Kansas, I can see them because I am licensed in Kansas. You need to be flexible and tolerant. Sometimes equipment fails. Sometimes schedules are different. It, you just have to be able to go with the flow and not get impatient if things don't work. You need to overcome whatever intimidation you have regarding being on a camera, operating electronic devices. If computers scare you, if you're nervous in front of a camera, maybe telemedicine isn't, isn't for you. Uh, you should be creative, have problem-solving skills, a television-like personality. I, I think that's good. You need to be able to talk and come across through the screen because you will really look a little bit different when you're on a screen versus if you're uh, in person. Uh, and it's best if you see patients by telemedicine on a regular basis. If you only do it once a year, you're never really going to get the skill set required to do telemedicine. A seasoned clinician is better. They have medical skills, so all they have to do is focus on the, adding the telemedicine part of it. And if there's a younger graduate, it's good to be coached by somebody who's had more experience. But that, that's true for pretty much all aspects of healthcare. During the visits, there's less, I've mentioned this before, it's just a little bit more problem-focused. Providers tend to look at the EMR more often when they're doing the telemedicine. Patients don't always understand that. I, I've mentioned that before. You need to be comfortable giving control to the facilitator. The, the facilitator now actually becomes more in control of the visit than the provider. You're not giving up all control, but the patients are now relating to the facilitator more than to the provider. And, and a lot of times that they, they're more comfortable with that because providers can be very intimidating and now they've got somebody who's less intimidating that they're relating to. So part of the reason for the high satisfaction rates. Uh, if you feel threatened by that, then maybe you should not do telemedicine. Uh, we have a number of regional sites in Kansas City. We uh, have Joplin, Wichita, St. Joe, Junction City. Uh, we're working on Garden City. We've got Great Bend. We're, we're adding more sites all the time. So it, you want to have more sites so that the patients don't have to travel as far. Uh, we're looking at doing it in schools. And uh, eventually, with Kids Care Anywhere, we have an, a direct-to-consumer where they can do it from home. Pretty much all of our specialties offer telemedicine services. There's no reason why any particular specialty shouldn't offer this. It's, it's something that anyone can do. And the number of encounters continues to rise. Um, right now we're seeing, we've seen as many as 400 per month now, ambulatory visits, and, and the number is continuing to rise. This, this slide needs to be updated to 400. Um, but, but it's hard to keep up because it's just continuing to grow. Uh, we see follow-ups. We see new patients. A third of our patients are brand new patients, initial consults, and yet we still see them and the patients are still satisfied. Two-thirds of them are established patients. Uh, we wanted to know, I was concerned about telemedicine and were we actually sacrificing quality of care when we did it. So when we first started to do telemedicine, we decided to do a study. Um, what we did was patients who were going to be seen in St. Joe or Wichita, this was when it was brand new, and we called them up and said, would you like to be seen in Kansas City in person like you were scheduled for, or would you like to do a telemedicine visit instead? And we told them what that was. It was a self-selected population, so it wasn't randomized and double-blind and all that stuff. It was self-selected. There's a limitation in the to the data. But uh, quite a few patients in Wichita chose telemedicine. Uh, and these are different age groups. Um, more patients uh, in Wichita chose it than in St. Joe. St. Joe is only 70 miles away, so driving to Kansas City is not terrible. Wichita, 180 miles, it's a much greater barrier. So uh, distance clearly is a factor in whether patients choose telemedicine or not. But regardless, we, we were able to recruit uh, 69 patients to do telemedicine and 100 patients chose not to do telemedicine. And 25, per, 25 patients didn't want to participate in the study at all. That's fine. Uh, so these are the age groups and uh, this is the control group and this is the telemedicine. These are the locations 
Now this is the sex, this is the age. And there's no difference at baseline except for sex. Uh, uh, for some reason, tell them, well, no, it's actually true. Asthma is more common in, in males than females. That's just the way of the disease. Okay, so what we did is we measured uh, asthma control using TRAC, uh, CACT, or ACT, asthma control test. And we basically normalized these to a 25-point scale because TRAC is a 100-point scale, so we had to normalize it to 25 and, and so on. So we, we made this normalized scale. But here's the raw scores. And um, basically, we saw them on the first visit. Uh, then we saw them 30, 30 days later. We repeated the, uh, the uh, survey of asthma control. And then six months later, we looked at it again. And we compared control versus uh, telemedicine. Not a whole lot of difference. There was no difference at all. Telemedicine and in-person visits had the same degree of asthma control. OK, well, so what does that mean? No difference between uh, asthma scores initial 30 days and six months. So this is the initial score. And at six months, what was the difference between the control and the telemedicine? The difference here was, was not very much. And there was no statistically significant difference between these two groups. Um, so the question is, was it inferior? We weren't trying to prove that telemedicine was better than uh, in-person visits. We just wanted to show that it wasn't worse. Okay. Uh, so how do you know if it's worse? It's worse if there if, if there's a difference of 0.5 in the asthma control test. That's a clinically significant difference. It's enough of a difference that the patient would notice the difference. So we were looking for a 0.5 difference. And if there was more than a 0.5 difference, uh, then, then we knew that maybe there was a clinically significant difference between the two. And what we were looking for was what is the probability that the patients did not have an inferior experience with telemedicine versus the control? We didn't expect it to be better. We just didn't want it to be worse. And uh, in fact, when we looked at the difference between control and telemedicine, it's high, but, but it actually uh, did not cover, cross the one. It, it crossed the one. And so this was not a statistically significant difference. And so we could say with the 95% probability that there was not a clinically significant difference between the two. It, not only uh, was it unlikely to be different, they were likely to be equivalent, but there was not a significant likelihood that there was an inferiority of telemedicine. It's, it's kind of convoluted and weird to think of it this way, but that's all we were concerned about. So we were able to show that telemedicine was not worse than in-person visit with the 95% probability. OK, one, one question I'm commonly asked is, well, can I get paid if I do by telemedicine? And it turns out that uh, 90, 49 states, that's just about, I don't know which is the 50th state. I don't know which one doesn't, isn't included. But 49 and, and DC provide reimbursement for live video and Medicaid fee-for-service. Uh, this number has remained the same since 2018. 11 programs reimburse for store and forward, which means in radiology, get an x-ray, send it to a radiologist. They interpret it. You can get paid for that interpretation. 20 programs provide reimbursement for remote patient monitoring. I can monitor their inhaler use. I can monitor their, um, their peak flow rates, things like that. Uh, and seven Medicaid programs reimbursed for all three, but there's some limitations. So it's, it's constantly being looked at, and this is a report from 2018 for the Center for Medicaid uh, about reimbursement policies, and you can go online and, and get this book. It's wonderful reading. It's, it's a page turner. Keeps me up at night to put it down. Right. 39 states actually have uh, reimbursement laws uh, governing payer uh, telehealth reimbursement policy. Now, that was Medicaid before. This is health plans, private commercial health plans. 39 states have laws governing reimbursement policies. Uh, it turns out that all of them, all 39 of these now require that if you see a patient in person and pay for it, that the health plan also has to pay for the same visit if it's done by telemedicine. Kansas and Missouri have such a law also, and they did go into effect in January of 2019. Kansas now has a law. We're in the middle of negotiating with a health plan that refuses to pay for telemedicine because they didn't read the law. So we sent them a copy of it with the highlighter and said, you're required to pay for it, and if you don't, then maybe we 
toxins, so that health plans don't want to, but they're being dragged into it by state law. There you go. Uh, and if your state doesn't have a law, uh, then that's your opportunity to go to the state legislature and propose one to your representative. If they're considering a law, go and testify and, and offer to help them write the law. After all, we are the lobbyists and special interests are always involved in writing laws. Why not? Everybody else does it. We should too. Only a few pri private payer laws require that reimbursement amount for a telemedicine should be equal. So. Uh, most of these require that if you pay for in person, you must pay for telemedicine. They don't insist that it has to be the same amount. You could pay less for telemedicine. But, but there are some states now that require that the, the payment amount has to be the same also. When you lobby for a telemedicine law, lobby f not only for, re for payment parity, uh, but, but also for reimbursement parity. That means that the amount that you're paid has to be the same. Uh, and health plan, usually state legislatures intend for that to be the case, but they don't think of it, so they overlook putting it into their law. You want it to be in the law, because then it helps you when the health plan wants to underpay you. Uh, Kansas and includes a provision that ensures that if that insurers are not requiring patients to use telemedicine in lieu of receiving in-person visits from an inward. They, you can't be required to do telemedicine if you want to do in-person. That, that seems kind of a backwards requirement, but it's interesting that it's in the Kansas law. Um, for billing uh, purposes, there's different ways of doing it. There's this 09 pause code, and there's a G modifier. If you, uh, if you use the same CPT code as you would for an in-person visit, and then you put a G modifier, you put G and then a 95, and then that tells them that it's a telemedicine service but it's otherwise the same service, and so then they can reimburse for the same. Uh, it's very confusing. Don't ask me for more details because I'm not an expert in, in coding and billing. Uh, for Children's Mercy in 2016, when we looked, it's, it's hard to look, so we, didn't, we don't look very often, but uh, the traditional encounters were reimbursed uh, at 39% with 48% commercial insurance. Um, and uh, telehealth were reimbursed at 41. So the commercial insurance um, mix at Children's Mercy is about 50-50, Medicaid versus commercial insurance. We collect about 40% of the charges. We charge a certain amount, we collect 40%. I'm sure that that's pretty low. If you're in private practice, you're probably going, oh my god, how do you stay open? So it's low reimbursement rates. But again, half of our patients are Medicaid. And, and our hospital gets other kinds of reimbursements in lieu of this kind of reimbursement. But it turns out that our reimbursement has been almost exactly the same for telemedicine visits versus in-person visits. So we're not suffering from that. You have to be licensed in the state where the patient is located. If I'm going to set up a telemedicine service and I want to see patients throughout the country, that's a lot of licenses. What a house that is. It's just getting one or two licenses is a real pain in the neck. And in recognition of that fact, this Interstate Medical License Compact has been formed. And it's an agreement between 28 states and the District of Columbia and, and Guam and so on, um, and other licensing boards, that if you pro qualify to practice in one state, then you can also qualify to practice by telemedicine in another state that's part of the compact. Uh, and, but you have to meet the requirements, uh, and then you basically apply for it. Um, the require, the uh, requirements are much less onerous. They, they accept the review of the original state. It's kind of the driver's license model. When I'm driving in Kansas, I don't have to have a separate license to drive in Missouri or each state where I drive. Uh, same thing if I'm licensed in Kansas and Missouri is a member of the compact. Turns out it's not, but if, it, if Colorado is a member of the compact, I could also see patients in Colorado. I'd have to apply to Colorado, uh, mention this compact, and then it's a it's a facilitated process. It's, so it's not that difficult to get it. Um, and so uh, you, you can do that for all of these different states. And that's in recognition of this fact. Okay, satisfaction survey. We, we do a lot of satisfaction surveys with our patients who see, are seen by telemedicine, and we ask them how their experience was, and they're pretty much all 
unsatisfied. The, the only reason that patients are unsatisfied is if there's technical problems and you don't quickly address it. So if the connection fails and there's no, you don't reconnect and they don't get to see the doctor, they're not very satisfied with that. But, but if, it, if it fails and then you immediately reconnect using your MiFi hotspot or some other resource, patients are pretty sad. They're, they're usually pretty impressed that you were able to, to troubleshoot and, and get that thing fixed. So they're, they're not dissatisfied with that. So, so it's really interesting how that works. More important, we ask patients, are you more or less satisfied with telemedicine or in-person visits? And the patients, two-thirds of them are equally satisfied with an appointment by telemedicine as they are in person. A third of them actually prefer telemedicine over in-person visits. Isn't that interesting? And very few of them are less satisfied, usually technical problems, like I mentioned. So we get lots of favorable quotes at Children's Mercy. It's a, it's a big program. It's constantly expanding. The patients are very happy with their telemedicine care, and that's why it continues to expand. We're constantly adding new providers to our uh, list. Um, inpatient consults is another use of telemedicine. I'm, I'm just about done. Um, um, there was one study by Stacew uh, where they did inpatient consults on patients with antibiotic allergy, and there, there was a physician assistant who did skin testing and then the allergist logged in and looked at the results of the skin test and made recommendations for an oral challenge or whatever. And so you can do inpatient consults uh, and, and that resulted in improvement. Uh, a lot of hospitals are now offering this technology, especially rural hospitals that have no specialists. If, if I'm a hospital in some rural city in central Kansas and there's no allergy specialists, but I'd like to offer that to my inpatients. I can set up a telemedicine service and contract with Kansas City, and then those allergists would do inpatient consults for my patients in the hospital. A lot of hospitals are doing that now. So something that I think is, is constantly growing. Here at Children's Mercy, we in the allergy department can see patients by telemedicine if we get an inpatient consult. So that's something we've got set up. Um, so we basically get a consult. Uh, we schedule the we basically we contact the telemedicine service, tell them there's a consult. They take, they go over, they get prepared to facilitate the visit because there is an examination, and then we log in and talk to the family. We do the physical exam and make recommendations. It's just like doing an in-person visit, and each of you fellows can, can probably have already done it. Uh, schools, uh, there's a lot of school programs now where students are being seen by telemedicine. This is great. The students don't have to leave school and parents don't have to leave work uh, to travel to a doctor's office. The student goes to the nurse's office and gets seen there, and the parent stays in their workplace and logs in. You can have multi-presence and be seen, um, and then the student can go back to class. And uh, we're, we're looking at doing this uh, by setting up that as a primary care office. It's going to actually be the patient's medical home at their school. Uh, and then patients who don't keep appointments, well, they usually keep school appointments, but it can be done. Uh, outpatient encounters between campus, we're already doing this. Dr. Barnhouse sees patients at Mercy East from home. Uh, I can see patients here in the Broadway Clinic from Mercy South. So we, between campuses now, we can do outpatient ambulatory visits. We're working on our schools program. Kids Care Anywhere is our direct-to-consumer platform. Uh, Follow-up visits are very common, and uh, we're doing COLA, and we'll continue to do this 10th year of COLA, by the way. So good, successful program. So where are we going? Well, a lot of the EMRs are now integrating telemedicine into their interface. So when you get an appointment schedule in your EMR and you see the patient, sometimes it will say virtual or online. You click on that, and then instead of going into the room to see the patient, a window opens and you just see them online. It's seamless. That, that's coming, and a lot of uh, EMR, I think our, our EMR is in the process of setting that up, too, so that'll come pretty pretty fast. Uh, I don't think that RoboDoc, I don't think robots will replace doctors, but I think that work together, we and the robots uh, can can work together in a in a good relationship and get along. <laughs> they don't they won't become our overlords. They will <laughs> actually be our assistants. And looking forward to that. I think that's very fun. Anyway, um, because people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who actually do. Um, I'm not changing the world, but telemedicine is, and the people who are involved in it are changing the world. And with that, I'm going to stop. And do you have any questions about telemedicines? Anything that come, pops up? 
Okay. <clears throat> well, as I said, uh, COLA is a form of telemedicine mm -hmm. education. Uh, these conferences are being recorded. Go to YouTube, search for COLA, C-O-L-A, type COLA and then allergy, otherwise you'll get soft drinks. And <laughs> you'll get our uh, channel. Make sure you subscribe to our channel. That way every time we post a new video, you'll know that the video has been posted and uh, we look forward to hearing from you in the near future. Po post those comments on, on COLA and subscribe because we love subscribers. Uh, anyway, thanks for joining us on COLA today. Uh, we're going to stop here. Have a great week, everyone, and uh, we will see you next time.